So, you join us for the first instalment of a DS float tutorial, looking at an in-depth approach to margin fishing in general. Today we're at a big carp venue, fishing for big carp, but we're going to talk about what I look for in a generic edge swim, be it at Tunnel Barn fishing for F1s or the Riddings where we are today, fishing for great big warriors. Um, it all comes down to number of bites that you're looking for first and foremost. If I'm fishing for say 100 plus fish at Tunnel Barn, I'm not going to be shipping 13 metres, 16 metres up a long edge. I want to catch them close to me because there's going to be a volume of fish coming into my peg. And depth of water is really important when fishing for carp and for F1s. Um, today we've got a deep edge down our left hand side, so it's like three and a half foot deep. Um, let's pretend we're fishing for F1s. I wouldn't look to be catching those on the bottom. I'd look at folding some reeds over and catching them shallow on like maggots or casters. Um, if we flip that to like a shallow swim where you're looking at 18 inches, two foot of water for F1 fishing, you want to catch them as quite close to you as possible to try and control the number of fish in your peg. But basically, the more bites you're fishing for, the closer you're going to fish to you is a rule of thumb. If we're fishing for, say, 10 great big warriors where we are at Riddings today, we're looking to line them up late on and they need to come in on their terms. So we've got a nice long edge that we can fish down that they're going to feel safe away from us. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. So a really important aspect of all edge fishing, where allowed, is gardening. Uh, some fisheries you're allowed to do what you want, cut a tree down, um, start a fire, have a party. Going to that extremes isn't necessary, but gardening your peg, clip, clipping some reeds back, making sure the bottom is clean, where allowed, can be real beneficial to maximising your edge fishing. Um, venues such as, say, Tunnel Barn, where you can do anything you like to a degree. If you're fishing for F1s down the edge on a hot day like what we are today and you've got a deep edge, instead of hacking all the reeds back, you're looking at folding them over and fishing shallow against them. F1s, when it's really hot, they want some cover in deep water and you can catch really well shallow up against cover. Um, if we've got a shallow edge scenario, again for F1s for instance, we're going to garden it. So we're going to get some shears where allowed, clip all your banks so you can get nice and tight up against the bank and you're looking anywhere between 12 and 24 inches ideally for fishing on the bottom nice and positively. Um, when it comes to cart venues and gardening, there's a tree down our right hand edge today. If I was to go and fish up against that tree, we'd probably get loads of fish in our peg. We're going to have issues with the tree roots coming out and potentially hooking the tree roots on like 020 up lengths and it's going to disturb our peg and we're not going to be able to fish properly um, in our peg. So where allowed, again, I do stress where allowed, if you can put your hand in the water, make sure you're nice and clear. Um, there's no good ripping the whole red whole reed bed out and then fishing on top of the reed bed that's um, obviously got all the roots in the water. All we're looking to do is clip the, the, the reeds that are on the surface of the water down and then we can fish tight up against the bank. Um, the only other scenario that we're going to look at today, we've got a really deep edge and we're fishing for carp. The bank's quite undercut, so I'm going to try and fish some particle baits such as like corn and dead maggots, something heavier than ground bait. And it's really important to make sure I can get my hand under water and get rid of any roots. So if we're hooking fish, we're not going to get snared up on them when we're playing fish in our peg. Or if they're wafting the bait about, we don't want them to flick the bait up underneath the undercut and catching all that roots. So just making sure your dinner plate's nice and clear, basically. So let's have a look at gardening the peg. As I say, I much stress, it depends on venue where you are to what you can actually do. Uh, here at Riddings, you're allowed to clip them back and do what you like to a degree, as long as I'm not taking down this uh, nice tree in front of us. If you're in a venue where you couldn't garden, but we've got some reeds that are overhanging the water, it'd just be a case of getting your rod bag and folding them down, and the weight of the rod bag will just press them down for you to fish up against the safe. Where we can, though, we're going to look at gardening it properly so we can get rid of all these little snags and make maximise our edge fishing. So I haven't totally lost the plot. It is 30 degrees and I'm wearing a coat. This is because these little bad boys, these razor reeds, the last thing I want to do is slash my wrists and bleed to death or die of whale's disease. So you're probably going to have a laugh at me for that. And then some gloves as well. Um, I was out the other week and my friend got a real nasty cut on his hand because he was gardening without any gloves and some razor reeds. So just a couple of seconds and you're going to save yourself from getting cut. The only other tools we need for the job is your landing net pole to hand. The last thing you want to do is clip all your reeds out 
nice windy day and then he blows all down to matey in the next peg and ruins his day. Um, you want to get all the debris that we're going to clip off out and onto the bank so it's not going to spoil anyone's fishing. And then just a decent quality pair of shears. Uh, these are some extendable ones. So if we're trying to lean over, if there's a big reed bed, we could just extend it out and you've got a little bit more distance. Um, today it's not too overgrown, so I can just have them in dwarf mode like me. So where we're actually going to fish, um, we're probably, I guess, 11 to 13 metres away from the platform itself. You can see there's this tree that's fallen over in the years and you would have thought there's going to be some roots in the water directly where the tree's fallen. So we're going to come just short of that. Um, I remember from fishing this peg previous, it's probably 18 inches to two foot, so ideal somewhere along here. So we're going to clip back these excess reeds, get them out and then get my hand in the water to make sure we've got no roots or debris there. So let's give it a go. So just a case of getting them nice and low to the water. Move the landing net pole out the way and then I can see these are clearly going to be in my sight. So we can get rid of these as well. Looking back at my box, I can see these ones are going to be in my way as well. Being a little one and only short on my box, I do need to clip back a little bit more than uh, a normal heighted human might need to. And then just get our landing net pole in. Try not to fall in in the process. I'm just going to gather those reeds and move them well out the way. And then just a re-scoop at that. So it's really worth taking your time when you're doing this. Um, on a hot day like today, you're going to spend most of the day mugging and then you're looking at setting up your trap for later on in the session for catching down the edge. So getting this right is really important. So we've cleared the excess reeds from the area that we're going to fish. Now it's a case of getting our hands in the water and just feeling and make sure we haven't got any debris or any roots in the way. Really important with those gloves to say it's going to save any lacerations on my hand. And there's just some short roots there that we can just pull off, just save us snagging off. Yeah, those little furry bits can really ruin your day. And that banking is, is really undercut there as well, which is quite surprising. So now that area is nice and clear, we can look at going back to see if there's anything else that's going to disturb my line of sight from sitting on my seat box. So we've cleared the right hand edge, that's a nice shallow edge. Now we've got something totally different, a deep edge that's well, well really close to where we're going to be fishing today. Um, I know previously it is really undercut here as well, so we're going to get rid of these few spiky brambles to start. Let's whisk them up the bank out of the way. I don't want them going through my hands. And what's really important we're not looking at, uh, there isn't a great big reed bed here, but it, you're not ripping the roots out. What you want to do is clip it so it's going to grow back. All that reed retention or the bulrushes is actually supporting the bank. So last thing you want to do is rip all the roots out and the bank's going to collapse being an undercut bank. So we're going to get rid of these little pieces on the top here just so it's not going to hip it. Our view of our float. Get that grass cut nicely back. So the beauty with cutting it, you come back in a couple of days and you uh, can't tell you've even gardened it. And get that nice and fine back so I can tuck it right up against that undercut bank. Um, and because it's really close to me, I can just get that with my hands as opposed to landing that. Tuck that up the bank. And then what we're going to do is get rid of all this grass root because that's the stuff that catches your rig and just slows you down when you're fishing. So it's just that bit that's just under the surface there. And then I'll just demonstrate, I know I've only got short arms, but how undercut this bank is. I'm not even touching anywhere near the back of the bank. And any great big reeds like, uh, roots like that, we're just, just gonna give that a gentle trim because they're just flailing all the way out in the peg. 
and you can imagine that's going to be absolute nightmare when you're trying to fish down there so you can just hold that one up tight give it a quick clip and make sure it doesn't sink you're going to get snarled up on that all day so where allowed it's really important to just spend that little bit of time and make sure we're nice and clear and then that one still just needs a little bit of a clip so that feels pretty clearish now just put my hand a little bit deeper okay this one a little bit deeper down there so I'm just going to support that and flip that off just do a final check and I'm happy with that and I'll just show you how undercut that banking is there. So I'm going to see the landing net pole in because my little short arms couldn't reach it. So you're looking probably two or three foot. We've got a real deep edge there as well. So that's nearly as deep as me, about three foot deep. So I'm happy with both those edges now. We can look at getting some tackle out and uh, coming up. So now we come to the minefield that is bait for fishing down the edge. Um, in the past, you think, oh, I'll take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, oh, and then a little bit of this as well. And you end up with a side tray looking something like this, and you end up scratching your own head thinking, oh, I'm fishing this here and this where, and what am I actually doing? So let's just have a little bit of a crash course on what I'd use generically down the edge for both carp and F1s. Ground bait, as we know, starting at the front, um, my carp mix is a great bait for pulling fish into your peg. If you're fishing in too deep a water, you can have trouble with them foul hooking and um, not getting the fish out on the bank, basically. So a nice heavy mix for fishing up to like two foot, ideally, two, two and a half foot, is marine halibut and swimston green. It's a nice heavy, claggy mix that'll cling to the bottom as best it can and still will trap loads of fish into the peg. Moving on to a generic mix for F1 fishing, I like to use the um, milled expanders. Um, the Amino Original, a full bag of that, normally a couple of bags of that to be fair in a summer session, and then 10% black. The black is just a little bit claggier and it just darkens it off. So um, I try and match the, the lake bed bottom throughout the year. So if we're going into winter time, a little bit more darker ground bait. In the summer, a bit lighter ground bait. So that's just a, a generic -y ground bait approach for both carp and F1 fishing. Moving on to expander pellets then. So obviously we're not feeding these. These are going to be key hook baits for both carp and F1s. Um, these are ideal when you're fishing on bottoms that are a little bit dirty. So if you've got like a lot of leaf mould in your peg and you're fishing maggots, for instance, and you're getting covered in crappy debris off the bottom, expander pellets can just mask that and almost like cushion on the bottom. So you're not going to dig into any silt or any into leaf debris. So you're getting a nice, clean, visible hook bait that's going to hold there. Um, these can be matched with um, micro pellets. Again, these are awesome for both carp and F1s. Um, a question you get asked quite a lot is, when do you feed ground bait and when do you feed uh, micro pellets? It depends on the venue really. Some venues that are shallower, they prefer ground bait, um, but you can have trouble with them gill feeding them of, um, if you're feeding just neat ground bait. So putting more micro pellets in when it's deeper, or if you have problems with foul lookers or gill feeders, micro pellets seem to be the way to go. Moving on to corn, a great bait for fishing in deep edges and generally for carp um, and I like to do this with um, meat as well. Meat and corn are a good combination for fishing for proper carp in deep edges. Um, I've got an edge where I'm fishing today and it's about three, three and a half foot deep so that's going to be my go-to, a nice heavy bait in the corn and that meat isn't going to wash around too much. Generally I fish six or seven mil and you can double that up with a double six mil on the hook for carp fishing. You can go in and fish in meat for F1s as well. That's something I always to steer away from. I like to fish more live baits when fishing down the edge for F1s. So that's moving on to the faithful maggot. Let's pick these up and just some reds and whites. These can be great for fishing shallow down the edge to cover. And also when you're com combining these for fishing with ground bait, when you're kinder potting down your edge um, in shallow water, again, up to two foot really. Um, bait for fishing for shallow for both carp and F1s are casters. I wouldn't tend to pot these in and fish on the deck. It's just great for loose feeding down your edge when you're looking to catch carp or F1s shallow. Um, 
some of them can linger in the reeds and it's just a great bait for fishing shallow with. And that finally brings us to the minefield that is some dead maggots. Generally, I use these for cart fishing. If I'm fishing for F1s, I like live maggots. I just think they're a little bit more active in the peg and F1s are just a bit more inquisitive, just in my mind. Um, and then when we come to dead maggots, cart feel safe that they've, they've been dormant on the bottom for a while um, and they're just brilliant for fishing for carp. Hopefully that's not too waffly. Um, these can be brilliant potted in neat or with a little bit of corn or with ground bait. Those are the three baits that I like to use. And then bunches of dead maggots are deadly for carp. Um, you can put 10 on like a size 12 and have a great big visible hook bait. And then finally on the minefield, we come to worms. Worms are a brilliant bait. These are nice fresh dendrobinas. Um, wonderful for fishing over casters if you're fishing for F1s um, or with ground bait for F1s and then just a standout hook bait for fishing over the top of any baits when you're fishing for carp like a double worm is it a real standout bait and can get you a bite when maggots aren't great on the hook. So mixing a ground bait now uh, I know this has been done a thousand times so I just want to make sure we're all aware of what how we want the ground bait mix and the consistency we're looking for. So this is my carp ground bait 50 at 50 of Swimston Green and Marine Halibut so a nice heavy mix and so take those bags out of the way a little stone on them so they don't blow into the water so if we look at this unriddled it's almost like a paste so that would be absolutely horrendous and ruined for fishing on a feeder but once you put it through a riddle it's absolutely awesome i'm telling you for fishing down the edge and um, the same as if i was doing with me f1 ground bait a real heavy claggy mix we're looking for just to try and keep them on the bottom so we've got a nice um, thick riddle there. I think that's a six mil, the, the biggest one out the uh, matrix range. And then we're just going to chuck a little bit on the riddle. That paste. We're just going to take our time pushing that through until it's all worked through the riddle. And then we'll have some nice fishable edge ground bait. So that's pushed through the riddle now. We've got a nice heavy mix. You can just give that a stir around. And then that's going to go straight to the bottom Water quantity wise, two bags of ground bait normally take about four pints of water. What I like to do is flood it with three pints. It looks absolutely ruined. It's like a slop. Let that absorb for say half an hour, then bring it back round and then put that extra point in and push it through the riddle and then it's ready for fishing down your edge. So let's have a look at the minefield that can be end tackle uh, for fishing for F1s and for carp down the edge. I try and keep my fishing as simple as possible. So if I was fishing down the edge shallow for F1s, um, looking at float, float choice first, I would go for an F1 shallow, um, a 0 0.5 so it's not going to take much shot but the the style of the float itself is quite a noisy float so when i'm slapping it it's going to make some noise when i'm feeding like maggots or casters down the edge to cover to some reeds um tackle wise for that i like to use power malcron 018 main line so a nice durable main line um this is the line that i use for, for everything f1 fishing throughout the summer so it's not going to break it's not going to let us down and then moving on to hook lengths Hook length to holes for shallow fishing, I'm going smaller and smaller. I think the closer your shot is to your hook when you're fishing for F1 shallow, the better. So at the minute, it, it all goes in fashions and phases, but I'm fishing a two inch hook length, 012 material, and then an MXC6 in a size 18 um, for like a banded caster or for a hair rigged pellet if you're having silverfish trouble down the edge. Um, and then the only variation on that would be an MXC1 if you're hooking maggots people like to ban maggots and lasso maggots so personally i like to just a straight hook them so hopefully that covers what we'd use tackle wise for fishing shallow for f1s down the edge so moving on for f1 fishing down the edge when you're fishing positively with baits like pellets or um ground bait on the bottom i'd go for a mud liner so a nice durable float and these are going to take quite a bit of shot so we're going to fish i say nice and positive on the bottom and um, so we're not going to have any trouble with them wafting about and foul looking fish so six number eights down the line and we're fishing nice and positive on the bottom um end tackle wise the same sort of material so using that 018 main line and then an 012 hook length with if we're fishing expanders 
an MXC1 or maggots or worms. That's like my go-to hook, if you like. Then the only variation on that would be if we're fishing um, with live baits to platforms and in a little bit deeper water and earlier and later in the year, which would be the XL wire slim um, in a point two, generally speaking, I say two, two to three foot of water, um, a light enough float to try and get some sort of natural fall if we're fishing in choppy conditions, but also heavy enough to fish, got a fly on my face then, sorry, um, heavy enough to fish with pellets and stuff on the bottom. So a real versatile float for fishing in that slightly, slightly deeper water. Again, um, rig materials would be an O18 mainline, so it's nice and durable, O12 hook length, an MXC1. Um, when I'm not fishing shallow, um, I tend to use like a three inch hook length if we're fishing from 12 inches up to three foot, just so you've got a nice bit of control. And then top kit wise for all of those, I'll just bring that into shot now. I've got a shallow kit there, and that's geared up with a uh, 10 to 12 orange slick. So that's set nice and loose, and that's gonna cover everything proper F1 wise in summertime. So for carp fishing down the edge, I like to use more positive floats with bigger tips. Um, you get trouble with, well, you get trouble with line bites with F1 fishing, but the bigger fish and that paddle going on its rear end can result in your float going under if you're not using the correct float. So my main go-to float choice, well, we've got a couple really, depending on depth of water, and there's something I'll cover in a little bit more detail. So we've got the XL power margin, and we've also got the pig. So pretty, well, similar style of float, but one's considerably smaller in length than the other. So the pig I like to use in shallow water, up to 18 inches. Um, I say it's personal preference at the end of the day. And then anything over 18 inches, I like to use the XL power margins. Um, these are real positive floats for fishing on the bottom when big fish are in your peg. Line for these sort of rigs, I'm using O20 main line, so a real durable main line, and then either an O18 hook length or a O20 hook length. I've got no problem going O20 to O20 with a four inch hook length and then an MXC, let me just get me maths right, yeah, an MXC2, which is the, I'll just bring those into shot, generally in a size 12. So they're a real durable, strong hook when fishing for like fishing to double figures that so you want to make sure they stay on the hook and we're not going to get straightened. And then if I'm fishing any banded baits down the edge, it's just an MXC3 and a 14. Um, again, O18 or an O20 hook length. Um, any variation on that, if you've got some slopey ground, um, say for, our, for argument's sake, Laugher grass bank, where it's just slowly sloping away and you've got no clear defined shelf, that's when I like to use the, bring them into shot, the XL stealth margins. So these are like a, a beefed up version of an XL carbon slim with a nice visible tip. I say we can fish these on that sloping edge or if you've got a cliff face, and they've kicked the bait into that little bit deeper water when you can see them coming into your peg and they're really tricky to catch. So these are nice delicate floats for going totally the opposite way to the positive ones that I've spoken about earlier. With these, I'm trying to fish the bait so it's like falling through the water or leaning up against that sloping bank just to fool those crafty fish um, on those days when you can't really catch them, but you can see them feeding in your peg. And then gear wise, I like to fish a long kit on that. And with that elastic wise, it's the brutal, that isn't very brutal at all, the 20 to 22 slick that you think, whoa, I'm going to swing a 10 pound to hand with that. Not the case at all. Um, I used to fish at Woodlands quite a bit. I haven't done so much this summer, but when you're fishing down the edge there, you're catching two, three pound skimmers, and this is soft enough to come out two, three foot on the strike and have no trouble landing a two, three pound skimmer or a great big double figure carp in no time at all. So hopefully that's covered end tackle wise. The only other thing I'm gonna to talk to you about briefly is pots. So flexi pots, I like to use these in the biggest size for both F1 fishing and carp fishing. More pot kinder potting for F1 fishing when I'm fishing ground bait um, down the edge and clumping it in or pellets that I can squeeze into a nugget and then clump them in as well. Um, I say for feeding like casters or maggots for fishing shallow, I'm not going to use any cups or anything. Um, you're just going to be loose feeding or catching it if you've got a longer edge. And then normally for carp fishing, I'm using a big cup. Um, so your cupping kit comes out and putting some bait in. Um, if, if I was fishing, say, pellets down the edge, I might put a, a little kinder pot in if they're being a bit cute, but generally putting big pots in because they can be scared of the, the tip of your pole a little bit more. 
and by getting rid of that little kinder pot on the end can just result in that extra fish. So finally, when it comes to end tackle, selecting the right plummet and plumbing up is really important. So selecting a plummet that has got a good surface area so you can map what's on the bottom correctly. If you've got one that's quite narrow, that can roll about and you can't really feel what's on the bottom. So a nice, heavy, big surface area plummet is going to register how big that flat spot is or where we've got that little cliff face coming off. Um, and finally, with plumbing, how big is big enough for the flat spot? So if you've got a bait box, flat spot and then a cliff face, that is going to be big enough to fish on. If you've got anything smaller than that, it's a bit of a no-go for me. Um, and if you have got the cliff face and you can't find any flat spots, that's when I like to fish those delicate rigs like up and down on the shelf itself and you can drag it up and catch those cute fish that will feed on that cliff but you can't really fish on it. So something I see overlooked a lot is keep net placement. When you're fishing short down your edge or short in general, there's no point whirling your nets out or down the edges when you've got lots of nets in and you're going to be disturbed where you're fishing and worst case hook the bottom of your keep net. So it's really simple but really important is, this is where this one snapped off, a loop of elastic on the bottom of your keep net and then it's just a case of doing it without falling in, placing it down, looping it over the toolbar there, and then I can fish all round my nets, no trouble at all. I say more relevant to F1 fishing, but lots of woodlands view and stuff where you're fishing really short round your nets as well. It's a great little tip to maximise um, the amount of nets that you can get in the water and keep your hook away from your nets as well. Right then, we've looked at guarding our peg and I'm now happy that my bottom's nice and clean. We can have a look, my bottom's nice and clean, hey. We can now have a look at plumbing up down the edge. So it's roughly about 20, 22 inches down this longer edge swim. Ship it down to the uh, 11 meters where I want to be fishing. And then we're just gonna whirl that plummet in and hopefully we've got a, a nice flat spot, that wasn't a bad guess. Yeah, so that's lovely and fat really, it only varies about an inch and that's what, over two foot of the bank. And then I'm just gonna go back and forth slightly to make sure it's still reasonable. Yeah, that's lovely there. And then if I can just give my plummet a little bit of a wish about to see if I'm snagging on anything, but that seems nice and clean. So I'm happy with that edge there. But if you look just out of shot, I'll bring this in. So an area not to go is this horrible pit here where you can clearly see there's brambles and all sorts of roots and reeds in the water. I think there used to be a reed bed there and obviously that's on top of that reed bed. It's mega shallow and you're just going to have like, all sorts of issues with dirty lake beds and debris and stuff like that. So that's like a, we've gone from a nice area that we could have been fishing our peg to a, a disgusting no-go zone. So let's have a look at the initial feed um, when we're trying to set up to catch down the edge. So we're in the afternoon now anyway, but we are just literally about to start fishing. So those last couple of hours of the match is generally when you're looking at catching down the edge. So here at Riddings, you're not allowed to use any pellets. So we've gone a bit old school, we've gone for the ground bait mix. Um, generally where I can, I like to feed micro pellets. I think you just hold, hold them in your peg a little bit better without having to feed as much ground bait. Uh, 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 sorry, the same quantity, but you would what you would in ground bait. So big pots coming sliding out. Got some dead maggots on my side tray. I'm just gonna put What's that? Good pinch of dead maggots and then the old bucket waiting there in the shade and then the lid will go on and that nice claggy ground bait. We're just going to wang that in down the edge and that nice shallow edge and that ground bait's really heavy so it's going to behave itself and cling to the bottom and not move about too much. And then we're just going to turn that over. Just take your time to get it in the right spot and that's just sunk right to the bottom. And then again, where allowed, we're gonna get a nice big bosh of water, slap that in, get a tap on the water, just to emulate, make some noise. Some inquisitive carp will come to that noise. 
and that's all we're going to do prep wise so say gun of the day is where you'd be putting like 10 pots of ground bait in to start and tr getting a great big volume of bait there they'll come into that bait hopefully we can see some sort of um movement or a, potentially a tail because it's nice and shallow down there if not i'd leave it 15 minutes and have a look down there um, and hopefully there's a cart waiting for us so we've plumbed up down that shallow edge and we found that 20 inches of water and now i guess we've got three to four foot down the edge we'll just slip this plummet on and have a look it's only a top kit away from me but it's really deep so that's still going to hold some fish there and that real undercut bank so we'll lower that down when it's too bad i guess so that's nice and flat and nice and deep and undercut so even though it's really close to me and we're fishing for carp which won't be many bites the bank comes out a little bit and it protects me and it's also nice and deep there as well so they ain't going to be able to be disturbed too much by me so i'm happy that that's nice and flat as well we're not fishing on a slope and now we can have a look at actually starting the swim off so in that depth of water if we're going to fish or if we're going to feed any ground bait it's all going to go terribly wrong the same as if you could use micro pellets and you were feeding micros it's too deep and they're all going to go a bit crazy on us so what i'm going to do is get half a pot of six millimeter and then half a pot of corn so heavy-ish big particle bait and then we're just going to dump that in and make a bit of noise so making sure i'm in line with the banking that's in and then cup a bit of water in as well and give the water a slap so ringing the ding dinner bell and we're going to give that 10 or so minutes and have a look on it obviously it's too deep to see if there's going to be any fish coming into our peg so it'll be a case of going on to it as opposed to visually seeing um, in shallow water where you can see the carp, that edge is too deep and too undercut to see if there's any going to be coming into our peg. So it'll be a case of just dropping on it in 10 minutes time. So we've fed our edge. Um, after about five minutes, I've seen um, a vortex in the water and there's clearly some fish in my edge peg um, down my right hand side. So I'm going to slip some dead maggots on the hook. Just going to grab 10 red ends on the blunt end. There's one. Sorry. Sorry. Eight. 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 So we've got a nice visible bunch of maggots there mounted on that size 12 and then it's just going to be a case I'll flip that over so that ground bait doesn't get too warm I'm going to wing that in down the edge and hopefully this one lurk in there for us so it's really important not to lay it across the great big ones back so we're going to try and get that float to go straight down in a nice straight line and then bolt straight away there. Could have been a small fish. So we'll just go straight down again with that. And then that shadow of the pole tip where, where you can, if you can lean it, clearly one in my peg, lean it on the bank so your tip of your pole isn't casting a shadow on the water. It's gonna make them feel a little bit more confident when they come into your peg. That float's dancing all over the place. I can't see it where it's moved it to. There's a load of coloration change in the water with, it, with uh, without the need for some Polaroid glasses. You can see that there's plenty of fish there. And at the minute, there's definitely some small fish in amongst, in amongst where the carp would be, because you're getting your float dance all over the place. I mean, maggots are getting mullered, so this might be a good indication to change from maggots to something like a double corn that we're going to slow it on because there's clearly some carp there but there's also plenty of uh, small silver fish about so we just want something that's going to be a little bit small fish proof so we've gone for a double corn hook bait that should hopefully stay intact for Mr. Carp to come in. So exactly the same, we're just gonna lower that down in a nice straight line and then pull tip out the way. Load of activity in my peg. Just gonna drag it where it needs to be. 
and the sail. It's really important to have a nice visible tip on your float. If you've got a real fine tip, you'd be striking at all these daft little silverfish bites and line bites and stuff, and you're going to end up with no hook bait on, or worst case, hooking a, a great big one in the side. So I've fed down my peg, I've gone in with some maggots and I've got absolutely mullered with small little roach trying to get that spider off me. Um, so I've gone in and double corn and there's clearly some carp in my peg but I'm still having issues with roach bites and stuff like that. When there's carp in numbers where you're feeding, you shouldn't be having issues with silverfish so I've got to change something. So I'm going to eat my words a little bit and I'm going to grab a pot to stick on the end. So I think they're coming into my peg, hoovering that bait up or kicking that bait um, down the shelf out the way where they're feeling safe. So I'm going to try and fish a great big toss pot over the top of my, I can see one moving down there now, over the top of my feed um, so they can't get away with coming in once I've fed with the big pot, shipped all the way back in, went back out and they've already had the little supper meal. I'm going to try and nail them with a, uh, a great big pot just to emulate what we're doing with the cupping kit. So we're going to go for Double corn again on the hook, just to try and small fish proof us. So picking the right grain, there's a little one and a bigger one through the top. And then a pinch of maggots and a nicely shaded ground bait. I'm just going to reach down there, get that nice and full. And we'll try and snare one of those crafty ones. So we've got that great big pot on, it doesn't look very nice, but if it does the trick, I'm going to tap that ground bait and maggots in, and then we're going to lower that double corn straight down the same hole, and then pole's going to be moved out the way. So hopefully that trap's set, when the carp comes in we're literally straight over the top of it there. So a few small fish indications in my peg there still but nowhere near what I was getting when I was feeding with a big pot, coming all the way back in, going back out. Indication there, but I've had no bow wave out my peg, so I'm not sure if that was a small fish again. And then we're leaning that pole out the way. And there we go. So just changing on the day, and we've managed to hook carp in the mouth where as I say if we would have carried on with that big pot just coming in and out and missing that opportunity or that window when they're coming in for a little feed so just taking our time with it onto the roller and then I'll flip myself around onto the box try and navigate my way through the bush And they've got a nice carp on the end. Nice little mirror. Lively in the net. Just gonna let me unhook him. There we go. And then we'll gently slide him into the keep net and just repeat that process. So I'm looking down there now, the coloration has died down slightly. So we'll try just with that big kinder pot on again. And it might be a case of big pot in, in between catching a fish and then just going in with that great big kinder pot again. And say so it doesn't look the prettiest thing in the world, but it's definitely doing the trick. So it's took a bit of time and we've had some real issue with silverfish today. But I've just managed to clunk into a big one down in my deep edge. So I've just changed to, instead of fishing a cube of meat, just put a bigger visible punch of meat. And it's resulted in a nice 
clean bite and not too many indications off roach and silverfish. So today has been a really good demonstration of, of how difficult it can be down the edge at times um, with fish coming into your peg and getting pestered with silverfish and I've had to change things to, to try and catch the carp that I know are in here and I know will feed in the edge. So I'll just take a time with them. So you're only looking for 10 bites later on in the session, 100 pound for this sort of venue. 80 to 100 pound generally the stamp of the fish in there. So don't need to rush them. That big boy slick doing the work. So just playing one from our shallow edge. It's been a, a tricky day, which I suppose is good for the cameras because it's not just go in, feed, catch a fish, go in, feed, catch a fish. It's actually like what it would be in a real match where you're fishing, say just for a handful of bites potentially down the edge. So just making sure this one's under control. So what's been the real issue today? There's been carp coming in your peg, but there's been like a million silver fish. So feeding ground bait has got them in that shallow edge, but anything small or normal hook baits, so like 10 maggots, which aren't a small hook bait at all, or double worm, any soft natural live baits, have just been absolutely mullered by small fish. So I've changed to like a big mill, a big 10 mil punch of meat, putting a big pot of ground bait in, this one's lively as well, putting a big pot of ground bait in and I've played about with a, a great big kinder pot in and I caught a couple on that but it weren't great so I've just put some neat corn and meat in a little toss pot. I'm just giving them a little mouthful so when they come in, there's just my big punch of meat. So they've got plenty of fight in them. Uh, plenty of, plenty of fight in them. What am I waffling on about now? Yeah, so when they're coming into the peg, there's that bulk of ground bait that they've washed about all over the place and then there's just, just that little kinder pot that I've put into the peg just to set that trap to catch these wide holes of carp that have been caught 100 million times before. Hooks come out in the net. So not a massive fish, but a carp nonetheless. So there we have a nice, chunky, wise edge fish that has done everything to try and avoid our hook bait but just by putting a few bigger particles into the peg and resulted in a crafty one that would have gone amiss on the hook. Let's slip him into the keep net and call that the last one of the day.